name is David Calvo. I'm the Director of Family and Community Engagement at CABE, the California Association for Bilingual Education. Today with us, we have Marissa Allen from San Diego Unified School District. Marissa, thank you for joining us. Hi, David. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Thank you for, for taking some time out of your busy schedule to, to be with us today. I understand you have a bilingual story to share. I do, I do, David. So I'm um, very excited about sharing my story with you today. Um, it's not the traditional story that we hear from other individuals that may have grown up in bilingual homes. Um, uh, so my, my story is very unique in in the sense that I myself am I a, a multilingual learner, uh, cross-border student having to learn um, first English when I was going to school here in the United States, and then later on um, um, having to learn Spanish and going to school in Mexico. And so the challenges that that brought on early on in my um, career as a student has really now come full circle now that I've been able uh, in the last 26 years, being in education, been, being able to be a bilingual teacher, a dual language teacher, an English only teacher, um, and later on an administrator for a school site that had dual language programs um, in the Chula Vista School District, and now being a administrative leader for the multilingual education department in San Diego Unified. Um, so it's come full circle for me. It's something that I'm very passionate about. Um, and something that I value in in life and my career. Wow. So you, you mentioned that you were a cross-border student. What does that mean? Uh, so many of the families that um, attend school in uh, the South Bay area are crossing the border every day. So cross-border, right? Crossing the border to come to the United States because they want their students exposed to the English language. And in my case, my family, we lived here in the United States and because they valued the opportunity and being so close to the border, um, my parents put me in school in Mexico and crossed the border every day going the opposite way. And so having to learn the language and going across the border is what we call cross-border um, students. Wow, is, is that how you learned your Spanish then? Uh, yes, I, I learned Spanish at a very low level at home, you know, the not the academic Spanish. Um, and so when I ended up going to school in Mexico at, the, at 14 years old, really, I didn't have the academic Spanish. Um, all of my um, my friends would say, oh, la pocha, right? Uh, making fun of my Spanish because it wasn't, it, it was very broken and it, it had the English accent to it. But as years went by and by the time I ended up graduating high school, um, mi, espan mi español mejoró muchísimo. Y, <laughs> y, entonces, y ahora cuando me encuentro a esas amistades me dicen, ¿qué te pasó? Ya no te oyes pocha. Um, <laughs> So that was um, something that I wasn't expecting to happen. I thought I would always speak um, Spanish with an accent, um, and it didn't happen. It, it Actually, the opposite happened. When I speak Spanish to Spanish speakers, they have no idea that I speak English, and the same thing happens when I'm speaking in English to individuals. So I think having access to both languages at a very early age and being forced to practice both really um, set me up for success in, in that area. Um, th there's another cute story I'd love to share that I sure. think really influenced that. And that is that I was a closet English speaker. You're probably what does that wondering. Mean? <laughs> so, um, my parents were very strict, as I mentioned before, with language. And so when we were in the school in the U.S., um, they knew that we were learning English. And so at home, they said, we only want to hear you speaking Spanish. You need to practice the opposite language. Um, and so my sister and I would go into the closet just to speak English to each other. And we would hear down the hall, we can hear you. And so that's what they said. We were closet English speakers. We were hiding just to try and speak our own language. Wow, that, that, that's a funny story. Marissa, so you, you became a teacher. How did that start? So I think my passion for teaching um, came later on as an adult. I started in, in business career, but 
um, really got involved with um, teaching adults in, in the workplace. And I fell in love with that. Um, and I decided, you know what, I've always loved children. I'm going to go back to school and get my bilingual teaching credentials. So I went back and got my B-clad and became my very first um, experience with teaching was in a bilingual um, transitional fourth grade classroom in National City which I absolutely loved, found passion for. It was great to see the light bulbs going on for my students and knowing um, about the struggles that I had in learning language and being able to empathize with that and support them really um, solidified my decision in, in continuing on and being a teacher. And so that's really how it all started. Um, and it was later in my career but there was just so much satisfaction in helping the families and helping the students and making them realize that they have an asset and that it's not a deficit, that you don't need to hide the fact that you speak another language other than English, because over the years, that was always the trend. And now that's shifting, right? Um, it's shifting so much so that we have families that are not native English speaking, wanting their children to learn other languages. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing now? In, so in, in now, <laughs> well, I said full circle at the beginning. So after teaching in the classroom for 16 years, I became an administrator. And now I am um, the senior director for the San Diego Unified School District's multilingual education department. So leading a huge department where... Um, we look at the programs for our English learners and our dual language programs, seeing them grow and making sure that we are structuring them in a way that they can continue to exist for many years to come with high quality levels of, of language learning. All right. So you've been in the bilingual education space for some time. What are some challenges you think that are in our field? So um, the challenges... I think as an administrator and even as a, as a teacher, some of the challenges that we see are with staffing um, in general, the expertise that the staff comes with in language and, and just the lack of enough teachers. So we have so many communities that want to add language programs. Um, the California Global 2030 tells us that this is what's great for our students, right? We know that learning multiple languages is great. We want to be able to offer that as schools and as districts. But what we find ourselves doing is fighting or fighting for those expert teachers to teach languages. And so the lack of staffing, um, I think, is the biggest barrier to helping our programs grow statewide. Um, in, in reality, that's the biggest challenge that I see more than anything. Any potential solutions to that? I see. So, um, you know, we really have to take a look at creative solutions. What are we doing with our staff that is experts that are experts in language? Um, are we setting them in traditional classrooms or are really we are we really being creative of with our master schedules? and how we how we're assigning them because there's different ways that we can be creative with our schedules and with the assignments the class assignments so that they're able to provide instruction to multiple classes as opposed to just one roster of of students and still building relationships because that's that's very important when when we're in relationships are huge in education whether you're learning one language or whether you're learning multiple languages, but even more so when you're trying to build multiple languages with students. So I think that districts really have to work with their unions um, in finding those creative ways on how to utilize our, our staffing. You, you just mentioned that uh, one teacher could work with multiple rosters. Could you give us an example for the audience that perhaps might not be familiar with the framework that you're talking about? Uh, just to shed some light on that? Uh, yes. Um, in particular, uh, many years ago when I was teaching uh, dual language, one of the schools that I was at was looking at growing the program into the upper grades um, for elementary. 
And so we didn't have enough staff members to teach those classes. And so we, we became very creative with how we structured our schedules. And maybe you have teachers that are teaching multiple grades, but rotating uh, their rosters. So for example, um, we call, we call, we do it a lot with math. We do it a lot with science and social studies, but we don't necessarily do it with language. And that is where you're departmentalizing, where you have a teacher that's going, maybe working with the four fourth grade students, the fifth grade and the sixth grade students and strictly focused on the Spanish language and hopefully integrating whether it's science or social studies with that um, so that you have that rotation going on. And like I said, typically we see that with other subject matters, but we haven't necessarily um, seen a lot of that being done with language courses. And I think it's doable. I think it provides that language teacher who has a passion for language to really focus on, on what they love with the students. Got it. That sounds really interesting. Marissa, have you attended a CABE conference or done work with CABE before? I have in the past as a teacher. And um, I have not, I'll be honest, I have not attended as an administrator because I feel that the funding that I receive needs to go to my teachers because they are the ones that are, have firsthand experience with our students and that would benefit the most from attending our Kabe conferences. Um, that's only from personal experience, having attended as a teacher myself and, um, I was able to send a huge team this last Kabe conference. They all came back saying, we want to send all our teachers. And so <laughs> that's the experience I have with Kabe. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. When was your first Kabe conference? Ooh, it was back in 1997. Wow. Over 20 years mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you reflect on what the experience was like back then? It was unforgettable. As a brand new bi transitional bilingual teacher, it really shifted the way that I taught with my students because being able to connect, to connect with other educators that were experiencing the same um, challenges that I was facing in the classroom, I knew one, I wasn't alone, and two, that there were so many resources resources out there that I could tap into that I had no idea existed. And so just the general feeling of support of having, being able to be a part of Kabe um, really made me a stronger teacher, honestly. Um, and, it, and it shifted my teaching practices completely. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. Marissa, so as we bring this interview to a close, I wonder if there's any closing thoughts or any final ideas you'd like to share with our audience. Just I'd really like administrators um, statewide to understand the benefits of sending um, their teachers to Kabe, um, being able to connect with other educators and being a part of a larger community really helps helps us um, navigate those challenges and find those creative solutions that we're talking about. And without that, we're limited to our own um knowledge and so the more we connect with others the, the more breadth of knowledge that we have we're able to provide services to our student ultimately to our students so i want to encourage everyone to send their staff to kabe awesome thank you so much marissa i uh, i it was great uh, interviewing you and and getting to learn more about your story thank you david muchas gracias hasta luego hasta luego hasta luego